Good Friday service. 
Though it's a somber remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, the death of Jesus Christ for the sin of this world, I'm excited that you have gathered as the church. I'm especially excited that we are joined today with folks from Timberley Baptist Church, Timberley, Nova Scotia, and Lighthouse Christian Fellowship from Birchtown, Nova Scotia. It's wonderful to be the church together. May together we remember and grasp the significance of Good Friday. Now, just a couple announcements. The Easter celebration will stream at 10.30 on Sunday morning. Again, you are all invited to join in that. And that service is preceded by a prayer meeting from 9.45 to 10.15. All the login information for both of these events can be found on our website, our social media pages, and in our weekly email. And I encourage you at this time to be sure to invite family and friends to join in that celebration. That said, that is still a couple days away. Today is Friday, Good Friday. I will open this service in prayer in just a moment after which Janice and Kyla will read from Mark chapter 15 and lead us in singing. Father, this morning we come together to worship you, to remember your incredible love, what it is you did on that first Good Friday. Jesus, we honor you for your great sacrifice. Would you now remind us of its significance? Would you help us to embrace it to the fullest? In all of that, may we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture lesson this morning, Mark 15, verse 21 to 32. I'm reading from the New International Version. The Crucifixion of Jesus. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. As they, and then they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see which each would take. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults upon him. How deep must the Father's love be for us? Which mar the chosen one? 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge, and filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed to this last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom. And when the sentry who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. I 
she reads nightly with her grandchildren. This has now become a nightly ritual and a tradition. Praise God for the ability to continue to minister to our family in new, exciting ways. The day Jesus died. Yeah, one day Jesus came to town and people threw their garments down. They all began to shout and cheer, Hosanna! Hosanna! Jesus is here. Yeah, let's see what happens. Oh, look at them all in the purple robes. But when the leaders in that town heard the cheers, it made them frown. They didn't like to see this man, so they made a wicked plan. Oh, they're not good guys. No. They came to get him late at night. With all their tor torches burning bright, the leaders took him to a place where soldiers laughed and hid his face. Wow, that's super mean. Uh-oh. And when the sun had risen high, they put him on a cross to die. They didn't know he was God's son and that he died for everyone. Soldiers, no, the sad people. Yeah. Ooh, what's happening here? Jesus' friends all wondered why the Son of God would have to die. They came and took his body down and sadly laid it in the ground. They sealed the tomb and walked away. There's never been a sadder day. Good Friday, remembrance of a brutal execution 2,000 years ago. 
the death of Jesus on the cross for the sins of this world. Personally, the memory of this event goes way back to when I, to when I was just a young guy, seated around the supper table with the rest of the family. Dad would take out one of the children's story Bibles and read the story to us. He would hold up the book, we would see the pictures. Over the years, I've come to a place where I've embraced the significance of this event, and I've responded by giving him my life, by deciding to follow him as my Lord and my Savior. And yet, I must admit that even though I've grasped the significance of the events of Good Friday, I tend to take it all for granted. So there you have it. I've embraced Good Friday, yet tend to take it for granted. And I know I'm not alone. At the same time, I can well imagine many people who would just be confused about Good Friday, about its significance. I mean, really, why would Christians around the world continue to pause and reflect on that brutal execution 2,000 years ago. And what could that ugly death have to do with today? I can well imagine many people would be confused about why we even call it Good Friday when it was such an awful event. Today, I'm going to read eight verses to you from Romans chapter 5. Nothing too in-depth or drawn out but I'll provide you with a series of inspiring words. And I hope that it will be a reminder for all of us in this. A reminder for those who have embraced Good Friday, yet take it for granted. And at the same time, may it be an explanation for those who are confused about Good Friday, its significance, and why we call it even good. So let me read to you the first two verses of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. There's a lot there, but I'm going to keep it brief. Now there's that term, some theological trade language, if you will. When Paul used the term justified, therefore, since we have been justified, to be justified in theology means to be declared righteous in the sight of God, or to be made righteous in the sight of God. Now Paul has been talking at this point for a while already about this whole idea of justification. That's what chapter 4 is all about. And his message had been surprising. He says, you are not made righteous in the eyes of God by being good, you are made righteous in the eyes of God through faith. Faith. Faith in what? Faith in whom? Well, let's read it again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is through the Lord Jesus Christ, faith in Him, that we can be justified, that we can be declared righteous, made righteous in the sight of God. Faith in Jesus, then, is what justifies us, which then in turn leads to this peace with God. And this peace with God is not only a feeling, an emotion of peace, as in, I feel at peace with God. It's also a status, as in, before we were at odds with God, now we are at peace with God. Before we were his enemies, now by being justified through faith, I'm at peace with God. Which then in turn leads to grace, this place of grace in which we now stand, he said, which in turn gives us hope. And it's in that hope we then boast, the hope that came from God, not from anything we did. Now, to be clear, this understanding of how to be right with a God is not a default understanding of how humanity looks at that. Most religions require good deeds 
in order for you to earn your salvation, your favor before the God. But this is what is so different about Christianity. It's not something we earn. It's not something we do. It is something that has been given to us. It is granted to us through faith in Jesus. So there you have it. A series of words that will inspire us. Faith, peace, grace, hope. Now you say, Swiss. What about this whole COVID-19 crisis, all the suffering, the people dying, the death, the despair? What about all that? Well, even into our struggles, Paul speaks, and he points out a silver lining, something that comes out, some good that comes out of struggles. You can probably think back to a time in your life where you went through a really difficult time, but good came out of it. And you wouldn't wish the difficulty on anyone else Yet the good that came out of it was very valuable. We see that in verse 3. Paul writes, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Or hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. Hope that comes out of all this struggle and all this pain. Hope that is far more than just being optimistic. It's not just an unfounded optimism, no, it's the blessed assurance. It's the deep confidence that all is well with our souls. Which leads to an incredible peace regardless of our circumstances. How? Well, it's not our own doing. It's a gift from above. It is through the Holy Spirit who lives in us, who has been given to us, that we experience peace. I was in an online coffee break this past week. And as those who were in attendance were sharing the good that had come out of this struggle for them already, somebody said, you know, in the midst of all the concerns we have, we're just experiencing this incredible peace. This is the peace we're talking about. Not a peace that is dependent on our circumstances, but a peace that isn't even rational. It's a peace that has been given to us through the Holy Spirit. It's a peace that is not our own doing. It is a gift from above because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Now, do we deserve that love? Oh, come on, be honest. Do you, in your own strength, in your own behavior, deserve God's love? Now, be sure if you reflect on that, that you compare to God and not to someone else, another broken person. Now, compare yourself to God's holy standards and you soon find out, no, compared to Him, I fall short. I do not deserve his love. We know we're not worthy, and yet we read that he loves us. He doesn't always love what we're doing. He doesn't always love what we're thinking or scheming. But he loves us as a person he has created to be in fellowship with him. He loves you, and he proved it. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates His love for you in this. That while you were still a sinner, that while you were still far away from Him, while you were still doing your own thing, Christ died for you. His death was ugly. It was undeserved. It should have been you. It should have been me. Yet His death 
made it possible for us to be justified, to be made righteous in His sight, to be forgiven, to be free. That is what is so good about Good Friday. We're going to watch a very short video. It's a skit that just portrays the freedom He bought for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Excuse me, son. Yeah? What have you got there? Got, got some birds, some wild birds. Really? Yeah. Where'd you get them? Got them in the field over there. There's a field with wild birds. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind my asking, what are you going to do with them? I want to play games with them. Games? Yeah, I like to play games with wild birds, yeah. What kind of games? Um, sometimes I like to poke a stick in there, you know, and they'll be like going, gah, 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 like that, you know? And then sometimes I like to rattle the cage, and they think it's an earthquake, and they love that. What happens to them after you're done playing games with them? Mm, usually I've been to my cat. You know, my cat likes wild birds. I'll tell you what, I am fond of wild birds. You are? Yeah, let me buy them from you. You want to buy my wild birds? Yeah. Or no good for nothing. They can't do no tricks or nothing. And when you open this gate, they're just gonna fly away. How much? You're serious? I'm very serious. Five dollars. All right. Ten dollars. Okay. Twenty dollars. Th they're wild birds. They're exotic birds. You found them in a field. An exotic field. All right. That's all I got. See you looking at the cage. Yeah. What do you got in there? You know what's in there. Mankind. Found him in the garden. Funny thing is, they put themselves in that cage. I had nothing to do with it. So what's your plans with them? I'm gonna play games with them. Games? What kind of games? All kinds of games. I'm gonna put games into their life that they think is gonna bring them so much pleasure that I'm gonna turn the world upside down. I'm gonna make right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And then? They'll be damned for all eternity. My father and I, we're very fond of mankind. I know. We want them to have access to us. So, I'm going to pay for their freedom. You want these humans? Yeah. You know they've promised you everything before. They're going to turn their backs on you. Some will, and some won't. You're serious. Oh, I'm very serious. It'll cost you your tears. I know. Your blood. Yeah. It'll cost you your life. I know. You're willing to give your life. I'm willing to give what it takes. This reminds us about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He picked up that wooden cross and carried it to Mount Calvary because he loved you and me. Folks, we find ourselves in a global crisis. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian who has already embraced the significance of Good Friday but tends to take it for granted, or whether you're curious, just confused about the significance of Good Friday, but looking for truth and hope and meaning in all of this. It doesn't matter who you are, we all could stand some peace, some grace, some hope, some divine love. Faith in Jesus is the path 
to all that. Friday, Good Friday shows that his love for you is real. If you're watching this on the stream, there are some ways for you to respond. If you find yourself a Christian, continuing to struggle with taking it for granted and wanting to ask for some prayer, there's a way to do that. If you recognize you need revival in your walk with Jesus, ask us to pray for you. If you are in need of greater peace, ask us to pray for you. If you're curious, but you're starting to sense that it's time for you to commit your life to Christ, to accept that gift of salvation, there's a way for you to indicate that as well. And again, we ask that you would drop us a line, that you would ask us to pray with you, that, we, that you would let us know that you've made that commitment, because we want to go on a journey with you, to walk this out, to journey together in this walk with this almighty, loving God. I invite you to respond. In a moment I will pray, after which Janice and Kyla will close us with the singing of a song, Here is Love. After that, the video will just come to an end. We just ask you to look at the picture of the cross at that point and to give Him thanks. Father, as we've gathered today, to wrap our minds around the significance of Good Friday, your sacrifice, Jesus. I pray that none of us would take it for granted and that all of us would embrace it. Father, I pray for those who may be doing that for the very first time, that you would give them the courage to seek you out in prayer, to ask for prayer, to share their experience with someone else. Father, I pray that they would meet you in this uncertain time and find you to be their Savior and Lord. For those of us who tend to take you for granted, Lord, forgive us. God, speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Convict us of what needs to change. But on this day, above all else, Lord, would you help us to grasp your love your goodness. Help us to understand why that Friday was so good. Now we ask you for your help in this. In Jesus' name, amen.